Well, welcome again, everybody. So good to be together uh, gathering. We are studying through the book of Acts together. Wonderful, exciting book of the Bible, a, a narrative of the New Testament church. The, the book of Acts really is an account of the power of God. It is just filled with the power of God from beginning to end. But more specifically, it's the, it's the power of God to accomplish God's plan by redeeming people. So it's not just a power book, it's power with a purpose. And it is God's plan being unfolded and carried out by his power. And the, and the focus of this all is on the church, the newly reconstituted people of God that are being formed in the book of Acts here, the New Testament church, which is both a product of God's plan and the means that God uses to carry out his plan, which is what makes it very exciting for all of us. The power of God working in and through the newly formed people of God, the church. That's why it's relevant for us. We are living in that reality, you and I, to this day. At the core of it all, at the core of all these grand themes and ideas is the miracle of God making a person new the new birth, saving someone. God working by his power and by his spirit in the heart and life of an individual and converting them, transforming them, calling them to himself and making him, them, a son or daughter. Our text this morning highlights a few parts of God bringing this new life into a person. There are other parts of the Bible that show us more detail about the inner workings of God's saving power, but this text highlights a few components that are important and I trust hope will be helpful to serve us and encourage our hearts. Our text highlights belief or faith and repentance, which gets expressed in baptism. It also highlights being filled with the Spirit, our need for the Holy Spirit, part of God. This is part of the component of what it means to become a Christian. We believe and we get filled with God's Spirit. And the result of those things is a changed life, a new life. Not who we were. New person, new creation in Christ. So these are the things we're going to focus on together this morning from our text, and the aim is to encourage our hearts with the necessity of faith, the necessity and need for the Spirit to be at work in our lives on a daily basis, and all leading towards a changed life. The point is going to come that these are not only starting points for the Christian life, but components of how we live day in and day out. For some of us, by God's grace, hopefully this will revive and stir up uh, and bring to remembrance our need. Belief, the Spirit, and a changed life. Let's read our text together. We're in Acts chapter 8, and uh, this is kind of a two-part series with last week. We're going to pick up in verse 9. This is the story of Philip preaching in Samaria. Actually, let's back up. I'll... I don't think it'll be on the screen, but I'm going to start reading from verse 4. Uh, probably verse 9 will be on the screen in just a minute. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed, so there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, 
they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. And when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This somewhat unique account shows us simply how the Samaritans believed, were filled with the Spirit, and had, as a result, a changed life. What is needed to have and to prove new life in the heart of every Christian. Very simple. First point, they believed. They believed. Last week, we looked at the unexpected way God brought about his plan. Okay, no evangelistic outreaches, no flyers, no bridge course, no mission trips, no church planting teams scheduled to be sent out, just a persecuted, scattered church. Refugees wandering around telling people what Christ had done for them. That was the mission plan that God used to reach Samaria. Philip is highlighted then as the preacher in Samaria, and he, re- he preaches a message of good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And the Samaritans, which we introduced last week, some of their history, we're talking about a group of people that had a thousand-year history of animosity with the Jews. They were at enmity with the Jews. They didn't associate with each other. And yet here these refugees find themselves in their cities, in their communities, talking about the Lord. Now, they too were expecting a Messiah. We know this from the conversation Jesus had in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. And they talked about the division. You worship here, we worship there. But both were looking to a coming Messiah. And Philip comes and starts preaching about this coming Messiah. And the message was compelling. It was compelling, and the power of God was present to heal. A message of the kingdom of God and the grace of God. A holy and just God, powerful, willing to heal, whose love formed a way to show mercy to the guilty and change them into joyful citizens of God's kingdom. We had an excellent, encouraging meeting at our bridge course this past Wednesday, and Jim Donahue preached the did the teaching on why doesn't God just forgive everyone. I sat and listened to 30 minutes of this gospel presentation, and I'm looking at these folks sitting in my living room, and I'm almost in tears hearing this gospel message again. I said, folks, you, you just got uh, probably one of the most clearest presentations of the essence of Christianity in 30 minutes. And it was moving, and it was compelling. Of course, I'm sitting there, so I don't understand why everybody doesn't just believe this. It's such good news. It was good news. It is good news. And Philip preached that good news in Samaria. They heard him. They saw the power of God at work, and they 
believed, and they believed, and they were baptized. Getting baptized was the expression of faith and repentance, an amazing, simple act that represents a supernatural new birth, buried with Christ, raised up in a new life, washed, forgiven, cleansed, a new life by the Spirit's power. And these folks were glad to walk through those waters of baptism as an expression of their faith. It was an apparent sweeping response to this gospel message. Men and women professing their faith, so sweeping that even Simon, okay, Simon is kind of the epitome of the not Christian person. So contrary to everything of God, he's there, he's leading the way, the major influencer in Samaria here, and even he is persuaded. This is a compelling message. This is impressive. I see the power of God at work here. And so even Simon makes a profession of faith and is baptized. Well, is this it? Gospel preached, gospel believed, people baptized, mission accomplished. Oh, that we would just be there. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Isn't that what we're hoping and praying for? A dozen people to be baptized in, this, in 2024. And wouldn't it be great if the Lord did that? And once that took place, is that it? Is that the plan? Is it mission accomplished? Well, apparently not. The story goes on for the Samaritans. God orchestrated things in Samaria to show us that there's more going on than just a profession of faith. Secondly, they received the Holy Spirit. Well, actually, at first, they didn't, which is what is so odd and strange about this passage. They had received the Word of God, but the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen on them. What in the world does that mean? How did they know? How would you know the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen? We have several instances in the book of Acts where when the Spirit came upon people, they spoke in tongues. They were extolling the things of God with their, with their mouths. That was one of the evidences that was proof positive that the Holy Spirit had come upon them. There are other verses in the scripture that give us other evidences of being filled with the Spirit. Great joy, deep assurance are other evidence that come when the Holy Spirit is upon and in a person. The statement in the text that we read that said, For they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus is what Howard Marshall referred to as perhaps the most extraordinary statement in Acts. What in the world are we supposed to make of that statement? Why the separation of belief and the Holy Spirit? What is going on here? Is becoming a Christian a two- or three-stage event? Do we believe and maybe sometimes later be filled with the Spirit? Are they one and the same event? How does this work? Here we see belief, we see baptism, we see receiving of the Spirit as sort of pulled apart, distinct events going on in these new believers' lives. If I were to give you just a brief review throughout the book of Acts, in chapter 2, Peter is preaching and he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will, be, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Seems like a package deal all together. But here in Acts 8, we see belief and baptism without the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter is preaching to the household of Cornelius, it says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, for they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. So Peter then leads them into baptism. So now we got word preached, spirit falls in the middle of it, and then they get baptized. In Acts 19, Paul asked those in Ephesus if they received the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what, are you familiar with what the response? No, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Like, we became Christians, we believed the gospel, but we didn't even know that there is such a thing, a person, as the Holy Spirit. And then Paul prays for them, lays his hands on them, and they receive the Spirit. Did something go wrong? 
in Samaria? Did Philip preach a bad sermon? Leave something out? Was their faith not quite right? They didn't believe enough. Or they didn't believe correctly. What was going? On? Why were Peter and John sent in to this situation? The text does not indicate that anyone did anything wrong, but there is reason to believe that God had something more in mind by delaying the giving of the Spirit. There's an educated guess as to why the Samaritan case was a unique case in church history. The Samaritans believed the gospel, but would the Jews accept them? There's a thousand-year schism between these two groups. Would it remain? Would it be healed? What would happen in this new era of the New Testament church? Would they see themselves as members of the same church of the Jews in Jerusalem? Or would they continue on in their own temple with their own version? Would they even want such a thing? The idea is that God withheld the Spirit from them for a brief time in order for a delegation from Jerusalem to come and play a role in their conversion. In laying their hands on them and them receiving the Spirit through the laying of the hands of the apostles, the fellowship and the solidarity was firmly established between the two groups. Now, this is a theory, this is a guess. As it's been said, J.I. Packer writes, with regarding the Samaritan experience, the guess, it cannot be more, that God withheld the manifestation of the Spirit till apostles might be its channel so as to stop the Samaritan Jewish schism being carried into the church seems rational and reverent. Okay, we've got Packer signing off. It seems reasonable. Okay, so that's a little bit comforting. It's become a somewhat well-accepted theory about why God did this. Nevertheless, what we have is a delay of the Spirit. What we have is an event in church history where God orchestrated the events to distinguish these parts, these components from one another, when maybe many times they all flow together as one, seemingly one event. Here, God pulls them apart to draw attention to each. Each of these events, there were a couple. This was a major landmark, benchmark in God's plan of the gospel going from Jerusalem. You remember Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Phase 2, Judea and Samaria. Phase 3, to the ends of the earth. And we see those accounts throughout the book of Acts, these major breakdowns, these benchmarks where God moves in particular ways benchmarking these major progressions of the gospel going from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And these tend to come across as quite unique as God is drawing attention. But why the separation of belief and the Holy Spirit here? That prayer you were going to pray for Rick for turning the pages needs to be prayed again. <laughs> Our text also helps us realize that a profession and baptism are not in and of themselves complete. Friends, we need the Holy Spirit. Do you see how separating these things and in this narrative, pulling them apart and drawing distinction between the two, realize that we have to come to terms with the fact that just merely believing, affirming, assenting, signing off, checking the theological boxes and say, yes, I agree with this, is not the whole story. It's not everything that's needed. Dane Ortland wrote a wonderful book about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards on the Christian life. There's a whole series of books featuring various theologians and Dane Ortland tackled the one on Jonathan Edwards. In it, uh, Ortland writes, becoming a Christian is not essentially the making of a decision or the praying of a prayer or the dedication of one's life or the believing of a doctrine. Note, it is not less than such things, 
But in essence, the beginning of the Christian life is a sovereignly granted explosion of new life. A change so radical carrying with it such a break with the past that is nothing less than a second birth. In the new birth, we are, for the first time, alive to beauty. That was the theme he drew from Edward's whole theological venue was just really becoming alive to true beauty, having eyes to see the beauty of God. And he's making the point that it's like merely making a confession of faith isn't the whole story of conversion, of how God saves people and draws them into his kingdom. The spirit is needed. God has a significant role in saving people. And we hear the gospel message and we believe it and we receive it and we affirm it and we walk out that affirmation by being baptized. But we need the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. The third point, their lives were changed or not. We come back to Simon. We come back to Simon the magician, now a believer. We're told just enough about this man to serve as a warning to us. He is a case of something having gone wrong in conversion. Somewhere, somehow, something was not quite right. Here's the picture of Simon before the gospel. He amazed people with his magic. He claimed himself to be someone great. He was a major influence in the city, and people viewed him as having divine power. He does in many ways kind of personify the devil himself. These are all the characteristics of the devil, ungodly supernatural power, exaggerated self-exalted view of himself, significant influence over others for evil, and ascribed with divine power. What you could say of the devil, you could say of Simon in this text. Then we have Simon after the gospel, after belief, after affirming, hearing the message, saying, yes, me too, sign me up. Went through the membership process, met with the pastor, had the discussion, clearly said what the gospel was, went online, filled out a can I be baptized form on our website, wrote his testimony out, passed that audition, was baptized, made it all the way through all these processes. And now we've got an account of a look at Simon after he believed quite amazing that he would hear the gospel and believe it and be baptized. Surely an extraordinary encouragement to the community. Even Simon got saved in that campaign. But something was amiss because when he saw the spirit given by the laying on of hands, he craved that power for himself. He offered the apostles money to obtain that gift. And Peter sharply rebukes him. It became evident that nothing had changed in Simon's heart. He just changed company. He changed meeting rooms. He changed the people he hung around with. Maybe some of the vocabulary changed in his life. But the same heart shows up. I want to be someone great. I want to be the one with the influence. I want to be the one in control. I want people to ascribe glory to me. And Peter recognized what was going on here. And he says, you have no part in this matter, no lot in this. I can see nothing has changed in your heart. I can see that your heart is still in a state just as it was before, stuck in the gall of bitterness, the depths of iniquity. You are the same man you were before, not a changed man. To think that the gift of the Spirit was something to be purchased was extremely offensive. To think in terms of the power of God, something to be possessed and harnessed and used for self-exalting purposes was clearly evidence to Peter that he had no part in God's kingdom. How could it happen? 
How did he get through the process? Who was the pastor in charge of that membership interview, by the way? It's always a challenging reality for a church, for Christians to come to terms from time to time with the reality that the seed of God's word falls on a variety of different grounds and not all respond the same. Sometimes it's good ground. Sometimes it's not so good ground. Sometimes it's ground that looks great initially but doesn't last. It's hard sometimes to realize that wheat and tares often end up growing up together in the same field. And while the impulse is to rip them apart and sort them out, Jesus cautioned the disciples, let him be. There will be a day to sort that all out. Peter Steen rebuke makes it clear that he's not inside the kingdom. May your silver perish with you. His heart had not changed. His life was no different. And he becomes an example of a non-Christian, of false faith. It didn't work because he didn't have a changed life. Good confession. Baptized publicly. Everybody saw it. Hanging around with the right people. He clung to them. He stayed with these guys. And yet, he was not one with them. But friends, it was only in confronting Simon that, that opened the door for any real hope. It was the fact that Peter recognized that and called him out and identified where he actually stood that actually created some hope, some opportunity for things to be made right in Simon's life. We don't know really what happened to him. In church history, the historians write about him, and this, this guy has a terrible reputation. All kinds of stories were, were maybe made up. We don't really know about this man. It, none of them were good. But what we're left with in the scripture in Acts chapter 8 is he's pleading for them to pray for him. Would you pray for me? Yes, Peter, you're right. I see it. I'm the same man I used to be. It was bad then, and it's still bad now. Nothing has changed. Would you pray for me? It's got to be one of the worst kinds of deceptions to think you're in the kingdom, but not. It's got to be one of the most challenging places to be, to somehow be convinced. I've checked all the boxes. I've done the right things. I'm sitting inside the church. I'm a member. I've been baptized. I've made my profession of faith. But nothing has changed. No spirit, no changed life. Our text pulls apart the pieces that make up the Christian life to distinguish the aspects that belong together and function together in order to help us, you and I, this morning, see the necessity of each. It gives us a chance to pull apart the pieces and look at each one and ask ourselves some simple questions. Do you believe? Do you have the Spirit? Is your life changed? Good questions. Difficult questions. You see, these components are not nearly tickets in, entry points. Check these boxes and you get in. They are not only necessary for entrance into God's kingdom, they are necessary for living in God's kingdom. All these components are ongoing and have to be a vital reality in the Christian life. The necessity of belief, faith, repentance, 
Okay? We are called to believe in God's word. What God says, we believe it to be true. Okay, I've been a Christian for about 50 years. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I'm strongly in, uh, tempted to believe something else. I have stumbled along the way for 50 years with believing. Sometimes strong, sometimes weak. We're not talking about a perfect faith. We're talking about a growing faith. But we're talking about a heart that believes now I know that I'm living a new life that began with belief in a word of good news that captured my heart, and now I'm committed to that word, and so I cling to it, and so I come back to it. So I remind myself of it when I forget it, and I repent when I disbelieve it, and I come back to faith. The Christian lives by faith. We live in the reality of belief, faith, repentance. Repentance is not a one-time repent of your sins and you are welcomed into the kingdom. Repentance is a lifestyle for every Christian. We all stumble in many ways. That does not change the fact that sin is forever contrary to our new life. And so it strikes our hearts with conviction. So the New Testament teaching regularly assumes our stumbling and our struggling with sin. It assumes it. It talks about it because it's the reality. You and I often stumble and struggle with sin. And it anticipates that in the life of every Christian, this is going to take place. But where the alarms go off in the New Testament and the lights start flashing is when there's no repentance. Do you see, do you see the point? Stumbling, your faith, my faith, stumbling in our walk doesn't surprise any New Testament verse. No New Testament writer is surprised when we say, oops, I messed up. I lost my way, I stumbled, I fell. It's when we don't repent that the New Testament starts sending up flares. This is the problem. This is where the, the church discipline laid out in Matthew 18. It's, it's all fixed around repentance. The, the, the consecutive uh, circles, the expanded accountability that comes to help deal with sin are all based on if the person repents. And you go to the next level, if they don't repent, okay? Try this, expand it, make it bigger, make it louder, so that they repent. In other words, do you see where the, the, the sin and the stumbling is less of an issue, but the lack of repentance is alarming because it's a lifestyle for us as Christians. Once there's repentance, we're right back to the normal Christian life. Everything is as it should be following our repentance. And we need the Spirit in our lives. The deposit of the Spirit in us is evidence of genuine conversion. But dependence on the Spirit is a daily requirement for every Christian. I, I was preparing this. I thought, I think I've kind of forgot this. I'm not sure I've been walking in enough awareness of my dependence on the Holy Spirit every day. In John chapter 14, Jesus introduces us to the Holy Spirit as the helper that the Father gives us. In John, uh, he goes on to say that the, the Spirit will teach us the things that Jesus taught and will help us remember them. He says that the Spirit will glorify Christ keeping you and I mindful of him and the gospel. He says that the Holy Spirit will convict us of sin and guide us into the truth. 
Paul wrote to the Galatian church to live by the Spirit so as not to gratify the sinful nature. And in Ephesians, he writes, be filled with the Spirit. How could all this not mean you and I have to live daily dependent upon the Holy Spirit? It could only mean that. That could be the only conclusion that every day we wake up, every waking moment, every sleeping moment. Spirit of God, we need you at work in our lives. There is no living the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit at work in us. Worship team, you can come on up. I'm close to the end here. What, what do we do with all this? We, we can ask ourselves these honest questions. Do I believe? And it's very possible that you came into this room and you're not a Christian. And so I'm, I'm asking you, do you believe? When you hear this good news, will, will, you, will you believe it? Will you receive it? And sometimes that happens quickly and sometimes that's a long process in folks' hearts and, and that's okay. So if you're not a Christian, I'm asking do you believe this good news? But even if you've been a Christian for 50 years, I have to ask you as well, do you believe? Maybe I could rephrase that. Are you believing? Are you believing today, yesterday? What will this next week look like? Are you in faith? Is there belief functioning in your life. Can I ask you, do you have the Spirit? Okay, I can imagine you're kind of scratching your head. Well, okay, I'm, what exactly are you asking me? Do you have the Spirit? Is the Holy Spirit alive and at work in your soul? Are you living in a regular, ongoing, looking to dependence on the Holy Spirit. Do you realize this is the Christian life that God has created? I will deposit my spirit in your heart. And that's how you will live the Christian life. If you've been a Christian for longer than 10 or 20 minutes, you have some experience of trying to live the Christian life on your own energies your own strength, your own abilities. This is where we stumble often. God withheld the Spirit from these believers in Acts chapter 8, maybe to remind us this morning how much we need the Spirit and how incomplete is our Christianity without the Spirit at work in us. Can I ask you, are you living a new life? Okay, my old life shows up all the time. Okay, the problems I had as a child, they're not hard to find still in my life today. That doesn't mean I'm not living a new life. Just because you and I could recognize some of the old nature in me to this day. The question is, do you see a new life at work in me? Do you recognize, a new, are you living a new life? You remember the, con the, the consistency with Simon? Different circumstances, different context, all the same heart motives. All the same things driving him. Is something new? Did something new take place in you? Where you can honestly say, okay, <laughs> that's not me anymore. I'm somebody else. I've got a new master, a new direction. I know whom I belong to. And it's not me. It's him. They're simple questions. 
I hope, helpful questions that we need to be asking ourselves regularly. And of course, there is the challenge of some of us not actually being a part in this matter. I hope you can see the blessing and the favor that Peter did for Simon. That he would not leave Simon under the false assumption that everything was okay when it wasn't. It may come across initially harsh, but can you see the mercy in it? Because now Simon had a place to go, something to turn to, someone to turn to, some way of responding. Can you imagine if the church only smiled and nodded at Simon? Oh, he's got some issues. And never positioned him to realize the reality of his own soul. Friends, whoever you are, you have got to come to terms with this reality. And I, I plead with you. As I thought this is going to be the strangest altar call, trying to convince people they're not a Christian, to admit you're not a Christian. How did I get here? Do you see the benefit of coming to terms with the reality of our own soul? The gospel is our hope. The appeal is come and be saved. Come and be rescued. Come and be filled. Come and be forgiven. If you are living with nothing but presumption that you already have it when you really don't, you've got to be in one of the worst predicaments imaginable. So come out. Come into the light. See the reality, whatever it might be. Yes, I'm in. I'm assured. I have the Spirit. I'm living a new life. I do believe. And maybe you've drifted in your belief. Maybe you've drifted in your dependence on the Holy Spirit. And this is a good call back to that. But if you're not, oh, friends, if you're not, don't pretend you are. But realize where you are and then come in. And then hear the invitation to come in. Pray for me. Pray for me that none of this would be true. Pray for God's Spirit to work. Let's stand together. I, I feel like with the text closing with Simon saying, pray for me. I want to close with, can I pray for you? Can I, can I pray for you? And obviously there's different categories going on here. You say, okay, I, I thought I was a Christian, but I'm not, or I was pretending to be a Christian and I'm really not, or I'm just not a Christian and maybe right now you think I should be. That would be great. I would love to pray for you. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian. It's like, I've been drifting in my belief, believing wrong things, not dependent upon the Spirit, just kind of going along in my own strength here. Maybe not a changed life. Church family, would you close your eyes and could I just ask, who am I praying for? And while the folks are just closing their eyes and praying and I'm looking and you raise your hand and just let me know, am I praying for anybody right now? How can I pray for you? Faith need to be strengthened, dependence upon the Spirit. Maybe you want to say, fill me with the Holy Spirit today, this morning. Could I pray that the Spirit would fall upon you, fill you, refresh you, strengthen you? Wonderful. 
Spirit of God, we do come. What a remarkable thing to simply pray, to call upon you. Father, you know the souls, the hearts, the lives of all the people in this room. Who needs to be refreshed? Who needs to be convicted? Who needs to be called forward? Who needs to be embraced, welcomed? Spirit of God, move in our hearts. Reveal yourself, reveal your power. Father, we recognize that belonging to you is a life of faith. It's a life of dependence, of being filled with your spirit, and it's a changed life. So, by your gracious power, strengthen our faith. Refresh us in your spirit and sanctify us to live for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.